Hello, everyone. Uh, welcome to the PNCBA Construction Summit. Uh, hopefully, everyone is able to connect and uh, looking forward to our discussion today. Um, wanted to just take care of a little bit of housekeeping first. Um, first off, I'm Matt Gregg with Brown and Caldwell. I'll be one of the moderators today. Uh, Jeff Wall with Sladen Constructors will also be on and uh, will be uh, participating throughout the day. So uh, Jeff will join us here in a little bit. Uh, thanks for joining the Construction Summit. Like I said, this is the fifth in the PNCBOA Summit Series um, and looking forward to a good discussion today. I want to start out by thanking some of our sponsors. Um, first off, Brandon Caldwell, Carollo, Jacobs, West Yost, Leeway Engineering Services, Sladen, HDR, Tetra Tech, and Kennedy Jenks. Uh, they are all at the gold sponsor level. We also have several silver sponsors, uh, Stantec, Tanemic, Honeycuts, Jade, uh, James W. Fowler the Company, and ESI Construction. We really appreciate all the support from all of our sponsors. They really make this summit series uh, possible and make, make uh, all the things we're gonna talk about today really happen. And so uh, really appreciate all the work that they've put into this and all the support they've given us. Um, wanted to make you aware of a few things that are going on today. Uh, we do have CEUs available for the session today, uh, which is hopefully a big draw for some of you coming in. Um, as part of this, there's going to be a CEU poll that will pop up during each section. Uh, please ensure that you answer the questions so we can track participation and make sure you're actually uh, listening and paying attention. Um, and this summit is worth uh, 0.3 CEUs for participating in all of the ses sessions today. So uh, good little benefit of, of coming to the summit series and really uh, hopeful that uh, that provides some meaningful value to you. Um, if you have any comments or some feedback during this uh, or want to make uh, others aware that you're, you're out there listening, uh, please feel free to tweet during the event uh, using the PNCBOA uh, hashtag or uh, their Twitter handle, which is uh, at PNCWAorg. Uh, once again, that's at PNCWAorg. Um, and they'll show up on the Twitter feed of the platform. So uh, that's another way to, to interact during the session. Uh, the way this is going to work, we've got about six different sessions laid out today. Uh, we're going to have about a five minute break in between each of the sessions to allow folks uh, get our uh, presenters changed out, uh, make sure everyone's set. So uh, you will have that little bit of break and then we do have a, a little bit longer break in the middle of the section so uh, we can go grab some coffee and, and refill on everything. Um, and then I wanted to make you aware of one thing we're going to do at the end of the session. Uh, most of our panelists are going to be able to stick around and we'll have some time for Q&A uh, after the session. So that will begin at 1230 or so. Um, what, what we're going to have happen there is we will have a, um, they'll, they'll post the, the link in the chat. And so you can join at the end of the session if you have questions for the presenters or just want to connect with the other folks that are listening in on this. So um, that's a little added bonus for today. And as we begin this session, I wanted to kind of make everyone aware of what's the theme for today. We were, we were looking at construction summit and said, how do, we, how do we make this relevant to today? And so really what we're going to talk about today is how are we evolving our workforce and approaches in a changing construction industry? And so we've got several different uh, panels and presentations and talks lined up on that. So I hope folks are thinking about that as we go through this, uh, really thinking about how is our construction industry evolving in, in the world? water and wastewater space, but even more broadly and how we're looking at construction, how we're looking at the workforce and how we're looking at the approaches that we use to deliver our projects. And so um, that'll be the theme for today. You'll, you'll see kind of threads of that throughout the different presentations um, and be looking for that and think about how, how do we do this differently? How do we do this better moving forward? So to get us kicked off for our uh, discussion today, um, I'm really excited to internet, uh, introduce Kabri Lerman Schmidt, who is uh, our keynote speaker for today, Kabri, is a project superintendent for Hensel Phelps, um, and I'm going to let her introduce herself and give a little bit of background, but uh, hopefully we're all uh, excited to hear from Kabri and, and listen to what she has to talk about today. And at the end of the session, there will be a few, uh, just a few minutes for questions, so if you have those, uh, please put them in the chat and we will get them asked at the end of Kabri's presentation. So please uh, welcome Kabri virtually. Great. Thank you so much, Matt. Hopefully everybody can see my video. Like you said, I'm Kabri and I'm joining you this morning from Seattle. For the last 14 years of my career, I've had the opportunity to work with Hensel Phelps and Chase work around the country. As a company, we're a nationwide general contractor and building services provider. 
And I personally have found a niche as the superintendent of high risk, highly phased active campus projects at airports and higher education campuses. Anywhere where there's a sensitive sensitivity to specialty systems, public regulations and teaming relationships where those are valued. So I'm happy to be here to kick off a great day of shared approaches to our workforce and the incredible industry of construction. So a quick story. Last week on Monday, I woke up after seven hours of sleep, took an hour in my quiet house to work out. And when my children promptly woke up at their 6.30 internal alarm clocks, I gave them each a hug before they jumped in the window to wave goodbye to me in my work truck. This was not a typical day. My work boots weren't on when I drove to a new office where I sat in appropriately distanced proximity to my new staff. And through the day, we discussed our relationships with a new owner and a new design team. And we wrote down a vision of the principles by which we wanted our team to be known. We discussed the goals and challenges we wanted to take on personally, and we reflected on the projects we had just left. We played a game of start, stop, continue for 2021. And maybe you've heard of this exercise. It's a simple but effective approach to an action-oriented retrospective meeting when with a team or with a teammate, you review the past and determine new behaviors. And isn't January the time for that? When we look back on the last year and make plans for this next one, new projects, new teams, or new goals for the same teams. 2020 was undoubtedly one of the more challenging years for many in our industry and lives, but I've spent the last few weeks wrapping up my previous project and considering instead, what do I wanna carry forward into 2021? Now, from my vantage point as a superintendent, 2020 was groundbreaking for our workforce. An international pandemic, social unrest, and racial justice movements these new global challenges forced our industry to flex beyond our accepted protocols, finding creative ways to deliver projects and support our teams. We challenged stereotypes, stigmas, and practices we thought exemplified our culture, like coming to work sick. I watched my crews and my trade partners crews take all the news in stride and continue to do what we all do best, use our skill and resources and innovation to build awesome solutions together. Now, PNCWA has brought together a great agenda today for us to spend time talking about how to evolve our workforce in a changing construction industry. The events of 2020 continue to demand change. And I'm gonna use this start, stop, continue framework to talk about some of the successes I saw and I'm seeing in response to 2020 and how I believe we can use our roles to take specific action to drive our industry forward. Here's what I propose. Next slide, please. Start. In 2021, we can start looking for ways to create change for our workforce by learning from the industry-specific problems that were further revealed by last year's challenges. Next slide. Stop. This year, we can commit to stop relying on the ways it has all been done before. 2020 shocked us many times over with changes to the ground rules. We didn't have a choice when our standard operating procedures were turned on their heads, and yet we're still building. Next slide, continue. We do not need to change everything. We will continue celebrating industry pride and in completing the tasks at hand, pushing our project teams towards more creative and efficient ways to do work and building up our staffs by training the next generation of builders. Our industry will continue to be a hardworking field of proud and loyal problem solvers. And remembering these characteristics that demonstrate our strength will remain essential to executing new ideas and increasing engagement. Okay, so we're gonna dig deeper and talk action. Next slide, please. Heading into 2020, I was running a $450 million airport terminal expansion project. We had over 300 skilled tradespeople on site and a year and a half left on the schedule. We had a clear vision of our path to completion and we'd built strong relationships with the community over the last four years. As an extracurricular passion, I was engaged in some industry specific organizations that were focused on workforce health in different ways. One was a well-established pre-apprenticeship program whose mission was to train underserved communities into the skilled trades. The second was a partnership with the University of Washington to create an industry specific toolkit to bring awareness to and the prevention of suicide in construction. And the third was a regional chapter of a nationwide labor organization that was championing their own respectful workplace initiative. 
Like I mentioned earlier, last Monday's lazy morning was not typical. As global events unfolded, what I found was twofold. Slide, please. First, there was an urgent need to respond appropriately to the newly revealed struggles of our teams and teammates. And two, that the people in our industry were becoming much more inclined to engage about topics that previously they had considered taboo or unnecessary in the workplace. So while I started the year thinking that my daily responsibilities and my extracurricular interests had independent purposes and goals, my awareness of that relationship between pursuing workforce health and maintaining team effectiveness was illuminated by each passing month of 2020. Now, my passion for the application of psychological safety to the job site was born from the unique opportunity provided by the extraordinary events of last year and my growing recognition of the ability of field management to impact team culture and build healthier, more effective teams. So what is psychological safety? It is the great finding of Google's groundbreaking project Aristotle when in 2012, its researchers began by reviewing a half century of academic studies, looking for the norms that concluded how the most effective teams worked. Now this finding has been echoed through inspirational leadership gurus like Simon Sinek, if you're a fan of TED Talks, and has really fascinated organizations in the realms of higher education, technology, and organizational management. However, with psychological safety's focus on effective teams, engagement, and safety, there appeared to me a natural tie to the metrics of success in the construction industry. Slide, please. Effective construction teams are more innovative and more successfully attract the best skilled workers. Effective construction teams are more productive. Effective construction teams have superior physical safety records. Amy Edmondson, who was the professor at Harvard Business School who coined the term psychological safety, she explains in her book, The Fearful Organization, when people have psychological safety at work, they feel comfortable sharing concerns and mistakes without fear of embarrassment or retribution. In other words, when our crews are burdened by fear, we lose team buy-in, innovation, and proactive safety practices. Next slide. Now, psychological safety is not in itself the end goal, but it creates the essential conditions to perform great work, supporting our ability to adjust to changing conditions and to appropriately care for our people by emphasizing their participation. For this ideal environment to thrive, the dynamics of job site teams needs to be challenged. And that's not an insignificant task because as an industry, our people have been struggling with serious problems that erode the effectiveness of our teams. Slide, please. And these well preceded 2020 and include traditional old school job site dynamics that can reinforce racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia, which create a hostile and unsafe work environment. Two, at nearly four times the national average, the construction industry's rate of suicide reveals a need to support psychological trauma that's reinforced by our widespread stigma and the inherent characteristics of our work. And three, the industry's skilled craft workforce has not recovered in the decades since the Great Recession. So how are we going to patch our leaky pipeline and train the next generation? Now, last year, these existing issues were underscored by first, an international reflection on the role of race in our country's society. Two, under the pressures of the economic impact of the pandemic, both suicide and opioid abuse statistics have skyrocketed. And third, when it comes to our workforce's future, while the start of the pandemic dampened the consequences of the skilled labor shortage, it's unclear whether we should now be preparing to preserve a generation of skilled trades through another recession of building or attract and train an expanded workforce. Now there are mixed projections, which include either a downturn of some construction sectors well into 2022, or possibly a renewed focus on infrastructure development in the coming year. We want our workforce to be nimble and proficient in the face of uncertainty. And 2020 highlighted our awareness of these standing problems. On a day-to-day -day management level, it revealed the impact of presenteeism on our teams. Next slide. Now, presenteeism, another vocabulary word, is defined as the problem of employees who are not fully functioning in the workplace, 
and that can be because of injury, illness, or another condition. Now, these distracted employees, they create a greater risk of physical injury for the rest of the crew. And this could be due to their distraction from the task at hand or because they're fearful to speak up. Here are some relevant examples. One, Terry, an operator, lies to his team about tardiness that is a side effect of a substance abuse disorder. And he has a battle, he doesn't know where to find help and he can't afford help if he's fired, so he lies. Or two, Jay Lynn, a minority apprentice, is subjected daily to subtle but disparaging comments, making her feel voiceless when she's asked to perform a task without proper safety training. Or three, ever relevant, half of your crew is sitting at home because they carpooled with a member of another crew who attended a party with a COVID positive friend over the holiday weekend. The remainder of the crew has started the day now worried about their own health and is stepping into roles and tasks with which they are less familiar they wanna go home to. In all of these examples, we see that loss of team buy-in innovation and proactive safety practices, right? And this results in the likelihood that not all crew members will demonstrate or even be able to choose the safest and most productive behaviors. So psychological safety creates an environment where team members can talk openly or ask for help, which allows them to get the support they need to effectively perform. It's about making space for conversation and being prepared to offer attention or assistance. And with it, the previous examples change. Terry decides to talk openly about his challenges and he receives information about his healthcare coverage from his foreman. He takes the first steps to effectively treat his substance abuse. Jay Lynn feels she can safely voice her experience to field management and that field management will effectively prioritize her safety training and address the disparaging comments without retribution. And what can you do for that distracted and concerned partial crew? You decide to spend the next 30 minutes speaking to them about new procedures for close contact tasks for the day and review the proper PPE. Those who choose to remain on site feel confident in their ability to focus and execute the revised tasks. You've gained their trust and they've each gained confidence in their ability to represent the team. Slide please. So jumping back to my two revelations, if with number one, we gained a new sensitivity and empathy towards the current impact of current events on existing stressors and the performance and safety of our team, then it's with number two, that we find a path towards positive evolution in how we approach our changing workforce. Next slide. So from the increase in coverage by industry publications and state level reporting to national trade union programs and on the job conversations, in 2020, I witnessed a recognition that the time has come to address the longstanding stigmas of bias and mental health in construction in each of our roles, whether contractor managers and superintendents, public representatives, designers and consultants, we can all take simple action to influence our industry in ways that increase the psychological safety of our teams and establish cultures that value the support and inclusion of our people. I believe this effort is essential to attract to attracting a future workforce by positively changing the perception and experience of the industry. And I believe our workforce needs to be more flexible, resilient and engaged. And that the last year emphasized that we cannot expect stability and predictability to be the markers of success. As I introduced earlier, psychological safety is not in itself the end goal but it creates the team environment that supports our people's ability to choose the safest and most productive behaviors, especially through times of volatility, ambiguity, or ultimately beneficial industry change. Here's some action you can take. Let's start with the topic of mental health and how psychological safety can be used to prevent suicide. Superintendents, we scan the field for risk, which includes our people's attitudes, readiness, health, and performance, right? Evidence demonstrates that greater awareness and education about mental health issues can facilitate help-seeking behavior. Education is the key to recognizing the risks to our people, and targeted information can break down stigma and normalize discussion of these topics. So here's a quick lesson for everybody in the audience. Slide, please. The statistic you should focus on on this slide is the one in the green box. The construction industry, in fact, has the second highest rate of suicide in the United States, and that's four times the national average. 
You can Google the CDC's reporting by occupation. And if you were to add in the architects and engineers, we rise to the number one position. Next slide. Here's the case study for Washington. In 2019, Washington had the number 21 spot in the, in the nation for highest suicide rate in America. And that's with 17.6 suicides per 100,000 people. And for comparison, Montana, Wyoming, and Alaska had the highest rates with averages of 29, 27, and 27 suicides per 100,000 people. Two things to note on this slide. First, 78% of all firearm deaths in Washington were deaths by suicide, a statistic which resonates with our industry's strong gun culture and is an important understanding when we start to approach suicide prevention training. And two, I wanna drive home why this topic is relevant. In 2018, Washington State lost 11 workers to on-the-job injury. We spend our whole day worried about on-the-job injury. Yet in the same year, 125 construction workers lost their lives to suicide. It's a statistic that makes people's eyes go wide, but then I'll ask the room full of workers I'm speaking to if they've known somebody who lost their life to suicide and almost all the hands go up. We just don't speak about it. Next slide. As an industry, there are risk factors that make us susceptible to mental health challenges. They're inherent in our work, which is high risk, production focused, and often has schedule or seasonal restrictions. How we execute our work produces consequences that present additional challenges. Manual labor causes chronic pain. We can be separated from our families and our leadership might have been promoted because of their ability to produce. They were not perhaps trained to understand and shoulder the demands of leadership. And finally, we have a culture that has supported stigmas that have kept us quiet and willing to deny fear. Next slide. There is great news. <laughs> there are a growing number of construction specific opportunities to educate the workforce about mental health and the application of suicide prevention strategies. Next slide, please. These field actionable resources provide big impact through familiar methods. The Construction Industry Alliance for Suicide Prevention, that's preventconstructionsuicide.com, provides amazing tools on their website. Toolbox talks, hard hat stickers, and posters to promote awareness, as well as free mental health screenings and intervention resources. I've used these with groups around the job site and for small group discussions with my crews, which were extremely successful. And that's measured through follow-up conversations of gratitude, resource cards shared beyond the job site, and I even had a night foreman who extended their lunch break to share his own struggle with his crew. The two-sided wallet card template on the right side of this slide was one of the resources I created for National Safety Week 2020, which also happened to be the first time of my 80 plus year old company took on the topic of mental health as a national conversation. The QR code at the top, it takes you to an industry specific recorded workshop that was produced as part of the Suicide Prevention Task Force I chair. It's a great resource to come back later and learn how you might approach someone on your team who might be struggling with their mental health. Any manager can use these tools and template protocols to evaluate and leverage your existing safety procedures for the prevention, documentation, and postvention of psychological injuries. So consider displaying these posters in the break room, add a toolbox talk to the monthly rotation, or post resources in Porta Johns for confidential accessibility. Consider also how you can leverage our existing safety systems, say by adding an addendum to the job site emergency action plan. Who are you gonna call if there's an incident on site? Managers, go learn about the professional support services provided by your healthcare coverage or your company's EAP program. You don't need to pay for formal training unless you want to, because even talking about mental health informally, say suicide on the job site in conversation, begins to break down the stigma inviting others to continue the conversation. Okay, switching gears. You will gain the benefits of psychological safety when you challenge bias on the job site. Next slide, please. When it comes to addressing bias, all managers have the authority to establish and uphold the expectations for behavior on their teams. Speaking as a superintendent in charge of 300 skilled craftspeople each day, I think of this like deliveries. I know I will get what I tolerate. Inappropriate biased attitudes, just as much as the amount of material that can tend to accumulate on the job site. So we must elevate the golden rule by teaching the platinum rule. Teach others how they wanna be treated. 
because the fact is our industry's homogeneity is not a new revelation, but we are unpracticed at cultivating, managing, and assimilating diverse teams. And making this change does not take a third-party DEI consultant, though they're a great place to globally assess cultural change as an organization. With the power to stand behind our people, us managers must commit to educating ourselves on issues of racism, sexism, homophobia, and transphobia. We must be informed because our actions speak loudly. A superintendent, any manager, can very effectively guide their crews by example. I'm out on the job site and I immediately rebuke a crew member's discriminatory joke. There is little likelihood it will be repeated, period. It can be that simple if you've taken the time to learn about your people and their diverse perspectives by building relationships. Next slide. Some other actions you can take. Owners, check out the City of Seattle's Acceptable Worksite Initiative. There's sample contract language to mes message goals to your contractors and great short videos that capture the clear expectations the city has communicated to its workers. It's nice and distilled and clear. And for all information sharing efforts, always think about how you can serve different groups on the job site. Provide targeted resources and include language translation. We had these BIPOC and LGBTQ mental health resource posters in the 20 somewhat Porta Johns on our job site last year. Now, BIPOC stands for Black, Indigenous, People of Color, LGBTQ, Lesbian, Gay, Bisexual, Transgender, and Queer. Why would you take the times to address these demographic groups? Because your people belong to these groups and there exists a reality that the experience each day might be different from the majorities. Finally, can't say this enough, appreciate your apprentices. By inviting an apprentice to speak, the crew's respect for the new crew member increases. Then go tell your seasoned employees how much you value their example for the next generation. Win-win. It is important to understand that commonalities will supersede differences in the psychology of reducing bias. In our industry, the universal characteristics of pride, loyalty, and family are a natural way to emphasize common ground. So our favorite sports teams were driving towards the finish line on a particularly challenging project. Next slide. Now, psychological safety also plays a vital role in overcoming the labor shortage and increasing workforce retention. Now, editorials that address workforce development, they typically focus on a handful of approaches that seem to make the industry more attractive to younger generations. They highlight tech, seek underutilized candidate pipelines, and applaud the benefits of a career that provides a living wage without student debt. And these are all compelling. But this advice rarely proposes challenging the stigmas and hierarchies of our industry that support a negative perception. And yet, hot words like community, trust, and purpose are revealed in Gen Z motivational workplace studies. So in 2020, you heard additional prominent contractors talking the talk and trying to walk the walk towards inclusion. However, field management is not always included in the corporate training that is often directed at salaried staff. What if the highest stakes exist at the craft level? Pre-apprenticeship pre program anew outside Seattle created a game-changing training called Rise Up. It emphasizes the role of psychological safety in creating a culture that will retain our future workforce. The founder, Karen Dove, created Rise Up so that she could send her female and minority students out into an industry where they would be respected and included increasing the chances that they would complete their, their apprenticeships. Participants engage on topics that include civility, micro inequities, and respectful communication. And notably, the information is presented in scope and style to be presented and digested as part of the workday. The Rise Up training resources and tools are free for anyone's use, and you can check out their website. Oh, okay. That's a lot of practical information. Let's go to the next slide. I hope you're still with me, unless you're off researching those videos or drafting new contract language, which would be awesome. There are really excellent resources out there and more construction specific data and messaging is published daily by our growing pool of experts. Now, if you found the concept and outcomes of psychological safety compelling and want to explore a practical path to leverage the resources and influence you have in your role, then 
I do have a recommendation. Check out Timothy Clark's book, The Four Stages of Psychological Safety. His framework offers a path to satisfy our people's basic human needs and develop highly engaged employees who can achieve their greatest potential. Now these sequential phases are easily applied to the nuances of construction, management, and design. Next slide, please. Let's wrap up. Taking these next steps into 2021, how can we best position ourselves to realize the opportunities we've been given to serve the evolving needs of the changing workforce? All it takes to empower resilient and safe teams and job site cultures is the decision by us industry leaders and everyday managers to pursue empathy, education, and resource sharing. Mitigating the current and future risks to our people while increasing performance by the industry's recognized metrics of success is a really compelling case for the pursuit of psychological safety. It's going to be our actions that produce trust and engagement in our teams, and the resulting culture will increase the ability of our crew members to choose the healthiest and most productive behaviors through whatever 2021 throws at us. Thank you. Thanks, Gabri. Um, really appreciate that presentation there. And we've got a couple of uh, questions that have come in here. I thought we'd start with that. Um, the first one, Gabri, was on the, the name and author of the psychological safety book, which I think was on the second to last slide, but just wanted yep. to check. You referenced Tim it Clark. earlier. Yes, uh, it would be Tim Clark. Awesome. And then, um, Another question that came in, do you think there is a risk of losing the openness and willingness to talk about these topics post COVID? And if so, how do we keep these topics at the forefront? I think that as soon as we can start conversations immediately starts to break down any chance that people will go back to thinking that the topics are stigmatized people are still dealing with changes to their routines at home. People are still worried about uh, family members that are more susceptible to the coronavirus. So there's always going to be a concern until everything is back to people back in school, my kids have been home since last March, to um, whether people are worried about people with underlying conditions that are on the job site. The concern will be there and if we start talking now about how to support people. And we start just learning what healthcare our own companies provide so that we can be that resource. Um, I think that's a permanent change. I think people will get used to seeing different conversations and there might be the old guard that's like, why are we talking about this? But in majority, every time I build a relationship that goes a little bit further than um, standards on the job site, it comes back like tenfold in terms of how people then start to treat their own team and everybody else on the job site. So no, I don't, I don't think that it'll go back if we start talking about topics that affect people now. Great. Uh, if folks have questions, please throw them in the chat and we'll, uh, we'll get them answered. Another one, Gabriel, you mentioned, you know, some of the challenges in, in a historical construction industry that may not be thinking about this, what, what's the biggest single challenge that you, uh, uh, you've experienced and maybe how have you overcome that in talking about some of these things within the industry? Um, biggest challenge is that nobody else has brought these topics up before, like on the job sites I've been on, so I do. Um, and maybe I like to tell myself it's easier because I don't look like a majority of the people on my job site and people are already expecting me to say something different. Um, I leverage that. I'm telling you, as soon as the conversation comes up, like if I'm going in and having 20 small group discussions about suicide on the job site, it is not a people staring at the wall walking out of the room situation. People want to talk or at least hear that that experience is shared. Um, and then you just, you hear one or more conversations in the break rooms later on, you see a somebody eyeing a poster up on the wall put the resources in porta johns, they're not ripped up and written all over. People are, people actually do want to hear some of these conversations, just start the conversation. That is the hardest part. Great. And if folks wanted to get involved, I know there was a couple, uh, a couple 
links you had in there. If folks want to get involved, are there good ways to do that or kind of easy entry points into this from what you found? Sure. Um, the specific examples I gave with the Rise Up program, um, the Rise Up program, I am a big supporter of because it's a bunch of excellent short form toolbox talks and resources. Um, I can share the resources with anybody. It just, it folds right into what we do every day, right? It's, you're not recreating something new. You're not trying to force something in. You just start with a, a different topic. Um, so I would say, start using the resources that exist to get the conversation going right into the existing procedures that you already have. Um, and then if you wanna go a step farther, like to understand what to do if you have somebody who has a, a mental health issue, there's a whole separate conversation about, well, as a company, I don't feel like we should be doing anything. There's this line between personal and professional. Well, that person is impacting your crew, right? The whole idea of presenteeism. So if you go back to that QR code, there's a link to a YouTube video that's just a practical construction site. How do you approach somebody who's dealing with mental health? Um, that would be something just to play in the background one day and take some notes on. Great. I want to give uh, just a few seconds here if there's any last questions that come in. All right. Well, Cabrian, hey, we really appreciate you coming and talking this morning. I think this is a topic that that everyone can relate to and, um, you know, spans the construction industry, the engineering industry, and really just it, it's a people thing, right? And so that that touches all of us. So uh, really appreciate you coming in and talking and, and participating in this. Um, for those that are sticking around, we're going to take a few minute break here, change out presenters, um, and we will get them going at, I believe, 915. Um, and just appreciate Kibri coming in and virtual applause if we can. And we'll talk to everyone in a few minutes. Great. Thanks, Matt. Thanks, everyone. Yep. Thanks.